DATV. The Greater Dayton Area League of Women Voters. Along with Up Dayton and Cox Media Group Ohio present Meet the Candidates. Your chance to learn about the candidates running for Dayton City Commission in the November election. And now, from the Dayton Metro Library in downtown Dayton, it's Meet the Candidates. My name is Andy Cobb. I am the president of the Greater Dayton Area League of Women Voters. We're very happy to have you here. We're in partnership tonight with WHIO, Dayton Daily News, DATV, and Up Dayton. Um, the Dayton League is celebrating 100 years in existence in the city of Dayton. We realize Dayton is the heart of the community in the greater Dayton area. And so on behalf of the league, I'm happy to welcome you to this candidate forum. We have four candidates here to take questions and answer questions this evening. Um, we in the league encourage everyone here to participate in the 2019 election. Vote early at the Board of Elections, vote absentee from home, vote on Election Day, Tuesday, November 5th. Local elections matter, your opinion matters, your vote helps make democracy work. Um, I'm gonna have a representative from Up Dayton come up to introduce your moderators. And if I could just give a little slight housekeeping note, if you haven't silenced your cell phone, please do so now. I'm like, I don't see her. Hello and good evening. My name is Lauren White and I am the executive director of Up Dayton. And Up Dayton strives to engage young talent in our community through launching volunteer powered community projects. And so we're excited to have partnered for this forum as we believe it is important for the younger demographic to understand who is in office because our constituents are really trying to build a better Dayton and we can do that with stronger relationships in both the public and private sector. So at this time, I will introduce our moderators who will share the flow of the evening. We have Jim Adi and Atana Jacoby. Hey, thanks a lot. Thanks for being here and thanks for watching at home. Um, our job here as moderators, we're the traffic cops to make sure that we all get to where we need to go to get all the questions answered and do answer some of the questions that you have. We'll be asking some of those questions. We're also taking questions from our audience here tonight to make sure that we get to the issues that are of most importance. I want to begin by introducing our candidates tonight, and we have chosen at random their position on the stage. This will be the order in which we'll be asking the questions and also get their rebuttals tonight. We'll start with David Ezradi, Shanice Turner Sloss, Chris Shaw, and Matt Joseph. Okay, now a round of applause. Thanks for all your supporters. <laughs> Each of the candidates will be invited to give an opening statement, but before we get to that, and that'll be brief, before we get to that, Antana's gonna tell you a little bit about uh, how we're gonna play this, the amount of time that they will have for their answers and rebuttal, and some of that, Antana. Thank you, Jim. So the opening statements are gonna be one minute each, then there'll be a question and answer session, which will be the primary focus of the evening. You all are invited to ask questions of your own, and Lauren um, and a member of the League of Women Voters are gonna be around with cue cards, so please make sure. Joe, can you raise your hand? So Joe is um, available as well, so you can get your questions answered. Candidates will have one minute and 30 seconds to answer the question if they are the original person who is asked, and then uh, the others will have 30 seconds as a rebuttal. Following the question and answer, we will have one minute closing statements. And as I mentioned, our goal tonight is to get to the issues that you're most interested in and to give the candidates an ample opportunity to talk, maybe not at length, but at least an opportunity to talk on the issues that are most important to us. I'll start with one very basic question. We'll start here first. Everybody will get an opportunity to answer that question, then we'll go back through the line for a very brief rebuttal. So let's, yes, oh, let's go to opening statements. That's a very good thing. <laughs> we'll have just a very brief one minute opening statement by each of the candidates, then we'll get to the questions. David Ezradi, we'll start with you, number one. Number one, I'm David Ezradi, and yesterday we were filming a segment for the League of Women Voters at the ATV. 
And they asked, you know, in light of all the things that have happened this summer with the Klan rally, the shootings, the tornadoes, you know, what were you most proud of on the city? And I think the answers, if you watch that, will tell you a lot about me. Because everybody else talked about, oh, the police response and the city crews and all these things that they felt needed, you know, intervention from the city. And what was left, what I said was, I was proud of the citizens of Dayton because they came together and they got the job done. And that's what's happened in my neighborhood, in South Park, where I bought a $14,000 house a long time ago and now houses sell for a couple hundred thousand. Now that's not always a good thing, but it is what government's supposed to do. It's supposed to protect your value of your investment, protect you and allow you to grow and prosper. And that's what I want to do if I'm elected. Thank you. Janice. Yes. Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for coming out this evening, and thank you all for moderating, and I want to also thank the host. Um, as stated, my name is Shanice Turner Sloss, and I am a candidate for Dayton City Commission. I'm also a mother, a wife, a resident in the city of Dayton, and I am an advocate for the residents and the neighborhoods. We've seen a lot of um, trying times this past summer, right? Not to mention the episodes of the economic downturn and the predatory lending and foreclosure crisis that uh, devastated our community. And so what we are and where we are today, Dayton residents deserve a commissioner that is going to advocate for clear processes, accountability and transparency and accessibility. And as your next Dayton City Commissioner, I am committed to do those things for each and every one of you in this room, as well as those who are out in the community, all 141,000 of the Dayton residents. Thank you. Thank you, Shanice. Chris Shaw. Good evening. I'm uh, Chris Shaw, Dayton City Commissioner. I am a lifelong resident of Dayton and a small business owner here in Dayton, a fourth generation <clears throat> business owner uh, in our community. Um, can't believe it's been four years. Um, but I'm just so proud of the work that we've been able to do and cannot believe that the work that we were working on uh, when I first started will be so instrumental in providing us with the necessary preparedness for taking on some of the tragedies that we've experienced over the last half a year or so. So I'm really um, glad uh, uh, to be a servant here in Dayton for the City Commission. And I want to continue the work that I'm doing that I started to do uh, when I first ran economic development workforce investment, developing the skills of our youth to take advantage of the many outstanding opportunities that are hanging out there. And I want to continue to do that work. So I am asking you for your vote on November 5th, and I look forward to serving you another four years. Thank you, Chris. Matt Joseph. Good evening. I want to echo uh, thank you to the library for hosting us, to the, the, uh, the two host organizations. Uh, it's nice to have a forum like this for folks to hear from the candidates and, uh, and uh, make a, a good choice. By the way, I heard from Mama Nozipa that the polls are open today and she's already voted. <laughs> so if you haven't voted yet, uh, tomorrow is a new day. Now's the time to go. Uh, as I said, I'm Matt Joseph. Uh, my day job is I'm a logistician. Uh, I, I've been elected to the city commission four times already. I've, I've enjoyed it, but I have to tell you, these last few years have been tough. Uh, my colleagues and I have had to make very difficult decisions. We've had to prioritize what we wanted to do, where we wanted to put the money. Um, and I'm happy to say it looks like it's paying off. We have uh, investments that are, that are coming around. We, we made sure that the streets were getting paved. Uh, we're, we've demolished a ton of houses. Uh, our bridges are new. Uh, we've invested in entrepreneurs. Uh, we've gone out and made sure that uh, everything that we could do to stimulate jobs, we've done. Uh, and the recovery is here. So I want to stick around another four years and be able to help guide that recovery. Thank you. Let's go down to the questions. And uh, once again, I'll be asking, I'll start with the first question here. <coughs> Janice will be going first with her answer. She'll have a minute and a half, then Chris, a minute and a half, Matt, then David, a minute and a half, then rebuttals, 30 seconds. Uh, we'll go all the way around. Everybody will have a, a chance to answer. Our first question tonight, how do you think the city is done with recovery from the Memorial Day tornadoes? What else needs to be done next? Shanice, we'll start with you. You have one minute, 30 seconds. Our timer's in front here. We'll tell you when it's time. Yes. Thank you for that question. That's a very important question. Who would have thought, right, that the city of Dayton would experience the devastation of 14 to 15 
uh, tornadoes that ravaged through our neighborhoods. The city has done, quite honestly, the Dayton residents has done a great job in the recovery efforts. Considering what we were up against, we know that it was, an, in fact, a natural disaster. But that is what my candidacy is calling for. We have to be proactive instead of being reactive. There were days and weeks long before the city actually responded to the needs of the residents behind the natural disaster of the tornadoes and the, and the Memorial Day weekend. I'll give you a few examples of what we could have done better. And they will, you'll hear from them that we've done all that we could do. But one example, again, as I mentioned, is the fact that we didn't have any generators in place. We didn't have any generators in place. Affordable housing is a crisis across the country, right? But we are experiencing that here in the city of Dayton, not to mention because of the tornadoes, the effects of that, we have a number of people in the city of Dayton that are still displaced. So these are, are things that we could put in place that we need to make sure that, again, that we're proactive instead of reactive. We need to have set aside dollars to address these issues, on which we have those dollars in place, but for whatever reason, the lack of leadership and transparency, we forfeit those dollars over to the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Okay. So as your next city of Dayton commissioner, I will make sure that we are proactive. Thank Chris you. Chris Shaw, what else should be done in, in the wake of the uh, tornadoes? Yeah, that, I, first of all, I just want to thank the community for coming together. Um, Wow, I, I was there the night of the tornado, drove through Old North Dayton, and uh, helped to clean up that evening. The next morning, I woke up and I walked the neighborhood again and did the same thing. And my colleagues on the Dayton City Commission joined me. But I was just so thrilled that the city services immediately jumped in to help. And, uh, and we did that work and we continue to do so. Our job is to connect folks with services. And we tried to get the message out about the different opportunities um, to do so, FEMA and, and the things that uh, were, would be required of them. But we wanted to be responsive. So folks would call us, um, uh, a lot of the leadership, I talk about Old North Dayton because that's very close to my, my home. And uh, we were just very um, willing to help and jump in. You, it's a tornado, you don't know that it's coming, so it's very hard to be proactive. But uh, we, because the city was prepared, the city staff was prepared, we were able to jump right in. We spent a significant amount of money with paramedic training, which proved to be invaluable in that space, search and rescue, recovery. But these things don't happen by themselves. One has to be prepared in the city of Dayton, and our city staff is prepared, and that's because we provide them with the tools that they need to do so. So I'm very pleased with the response that the city um, uh, engaged with the tornado relief. Matt Joseph. Your take on the recovery from the tornadoes, what else needs to be done? Yes, sir. Uh, I, I echo what my colleague said a moment ago. Uh, I'm very proud of our city services. Uh, within minutes of the tornado, our folks were already headed into work knowing that they were going to be cleaning up, repairing water lines, uh, helping, uh, you know, finding injured people. Uh, within minutes, they started reporting. Uh, they knew they were well-trained. Uh, and I, I can't take credit for them showing up, but I can't take credit for making sure they're provided with the resources and the training that they need to do those jobs. Uh, you know, nobody wants a disaster like this. Uh, but uh, when it happens and you see your folks respond like they did so professionally, so quickly, I'll tell you, I was really proud. I was proud to be a commissioner that day. And on top of that, like Commissioner Shaw just said, to see the neighborhood leadership step forward. He mentioned Matt Tepper in Old North Dayton. The guy runs a bakery in the daytime, runs a neighborhood organization, and he ran for you know six weeks, two months, still still running uh, uh, the the renewal organization, the recovery organization for his neighborhood. The guy is amazing, and he's by far not the only one. There are plenty of people who work like that, work hard. I was proud to be among the hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people that showed up that Saturday and and days afterward to help with the cleanup. That community response made me very proud. Um, we had set aside from the year before uh, extra funding in our reserve fund, which we were able to spend on tornado, on tornado recovery, and we hope that a lot of that will be reimbursed by FEMA. Uh, we were, like I said, we made sure our folks were trained. Uh, I think we, we did our due diligence and made sure that we were as ready as anybody could be for seven tornadoes. Uh, to be done, we just need to follow up and make sure that nobody's falling through the cracks. Thank you. David Ezrati. <clears throat> so, natural disasters are pretty, pretty big events can't predict them, but you can do some things. Like 
in my neighborhood, their raid siren still works. Works great, let people know that the tornado watch was happening. They've been disabled through a lot of the city or not maintained. That needs to be put back in place because obviously we're at risk. But we can talk all we want about the recovery efforts, efforts and how well we cleared up and cleaned up and everything else. But we have a fundamental basic problem <coughs> in that one in our response, we did not call in the National Guard right away to provide safety and security for people to keep their properties intact and safe. That is a primary value. See people sitting out with signs saying, saying they're going to shoot looters. They shouldn't have to worry about looters. The National Guard could have come here. The National Guard has generators and could have got our well field back together. Nobody in City Hall thought of that or did anything about it. But the bigger problem is a lot of these people were, that were hit live in homes where they were underinsured or they were you know, living you know, right at the, the basic, they, they didn't have the money, they didn't have the reserves, and they can't go out and buy a house again because the houses they could buy, the house, some of the houses that got destroyed cost less than $50,000 in this city. And you can't even get a loan for a house under $50,000. We need to fix that. Citywide development is a bank that's a slush fund that should be doing the funding for these things, and we're going to make it possible for you to buy a house in Dayton without having to go to the national banks who won't talk to you. Thank we'll you. We'll go to rebuttal now. Shanice, uh, each of the candidates will have an opportunity for 30 seconds of rebuttal. Shanice, we'll start with you if you, if you care. Yes. Thank you very much for the opportunity. So as you heard that the sirens, they do not work in the city of Dayton. Hence the reason why we have to be proactive to make sure that we have those mechanisms in place so that we can warn our residents such as incidents, such as the natural disaster coming into our area. The other thing is, again, we have to make sure that our staff have the tools and the resources that, need, that they need so that they are able to respond to whatever um, crisis or natural disasters that may come into our area. And again, we have to have innovative, creative thought and new leadership to bring about those new mechanisms in place to really respond to the needs of the residents. Thank Chris you. Chris Shaw, your rebuttal. Yes, um, it, uh, tornado sirens. That is um, old technology. There's new technology out there, cell phones and other types of, of uh, equipment that is much more uh, efficient. The and cell works, phone towers were me, down. It works much it don't better. Work. Works much better than, than that. Uh, tornado siren towers go down too. Uh, generators. We had generators. It takes a while to get them set up, but it was remarkable how quickly, after 15 tornadoes hit our region, that we were able to get up and running. That is remarkable and a very good job on behalf of city staff. Matt Joseph. Uh, just one point. I, I agree with Commissioner Shaw. Uh, I want to make the point that uh, if you look at the stats of crime in the neighborhoods where the tornadoes hit, it actually went down after the tornadoes hit. Uh, we looked at calling the National Guard. There was no need. Thank you. Final rebuttal, uh, David Ezrati. As someone who's actually served in the military, knows what the military can do and what the National Guard can do, believe me, they would have been a lot of good helping hands there to get things done, get things moving a lot quicker if we brought the National Guard. The generators wouldn't have cost us a penny. This is what they train for. Sirens work. I heard them. Other people hear them. Not everybody has a cell phone that works. And if power goes out, some of this stuff doesn't work either. So sirens help. Thank you very much. That's round one. Uh, we'll continue with the questions in just a moment. I want to thank all our audience members for being here and being so patient with us, providing your questions. Uh, if you're interested in uh, finding out more about the candidates, you can go online to vote.daytondailynews.com. In case you've just joined us, we're talking with the candidates for Dayton City Commission. Itana Jacoby will continue with our questions. And our first question will go to Chris Shaw. We're going to start with a question from the audience. In response to strict anti-abortion state laws, cities like Austin, Texas are funding logistical support like transportation, lodging, and child care to low-income people seeking abortion services. Would you support a plan to do the same in Dayton? I think that a woman's right to choose is critically important. Um, I have a daughter, and I, I, no one else should be able to tell her what to do with her own body. Um, I think that all kinds of health services should be available and supported. That means transportation or any other kind of service. I think we need to do what we can do to make these services more available uh, to everyone. So yes, I, I would support that. Thank you. Commissioner Joseph. Yep. 
I, I believe that, uh, well, I'd like to see a, a gradual decrease in abortions, but I don't believe in coercion. I don't think anybody should be told what to do or made to do. I think the best way to get a gradual decrease in abortions is to decrease poverty, is to make health care available to women, is to make child care available, to make having a child uh, easier uh, and uh, less of a stigma, less of a pain. Um, that's the way I would go at the problem. Thank you. Would you support the plan specifically that's Which mentioned in the question? Uh, this is provide health care and provide transportation to women. Absolutely. Transporta transportation, lodging, child care to low income people seeking abortion services. I'd have to see it. I don't know. I mean, I, I, I support health care and I support uh, I, I support getting people better wages. I support in increasing people's quality of life in the hopes that they would choose not to have an abortion because it's it's easier for them to have a child. So I'd have to see the plan. But thank you. I repeat the question as it's going to um, David Izrati. In response to strict anti-abortion state laws, cities like Austin, Texas, are funding logistical support like transportation, lodging, and child care to low-income people seeking abortion services. Would you support a plan to do the same in Dayton? What's, how long do we get to respond? Min you have a minute, minute and a half. half. Okay, thank you. All right, so Austin, innovative city, big thoughts, big ideas, great, fantastic. Okay, but the problem here is our medical establishment here consists of two monolithic companies that have bought up every doctor's office in town and are running a duopoly and screwing this community by charging us too much and having inadequate outcomes. Yet, they don't pay taxes on their property. They have private money for private police forces that have the same police powers that our police officers do. That is unacceptable. And when you look at where their money comes from, a majority of it is federal tax dollars, Medicare. I think it's time that they stop hiding behind this, oh, we're a Catholic organization or a Christian organization or a Seventh-day Adventist organization. We're going to do this transfer agreement thing. I'd say, excuse me, if you're going to call all that and tell us how to run health care, you're going to pay taxes because we need competition in this community, and that hospital on Salem should never have been torn down. And it would have been a great place to put a lot of people up right after the tornadoes. We paid for that by giving them tax breaks for 70, 80 years. The CEOs are making $4 million in a nonprofit. This is unacceptable. This is not the way decent people treat it. So not only would I say, we'll transport them to somewhere else, we might even start our own hospital system and make it so that people can afford it. The city of Dayton self-insured. Thank you. I'm sure we can do a better job for less money. To Thank you. To clarify, you would support a plan? Absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> Denise, Turner Sloss. So, absolutely I will support legislation, legislation for... Um, Logistical support, including yes. transportation and lodging and child care. Very much. <laughs> absolutely I will support. Um, restrictive policies such as that, as you mentioned from the city of Austin, is what keeps vulnerable communities impoverished, right? So again, we have to make sure that we are supporting individuals, minorities, as well as individuals from um, communities that have been suffering from, again, issues of, of blight and issues of poverty to make sure that, again, that they have the tools and the resources so that they have the fair shot at um, a quality and decent life, right? But the other part of that, too, is we have to make sure that we're educating. And how do we educate? We have to put policy and programs in place and funding in place so that we can prevent pre abortion from even being of consideration. We have to educate in our schools to make sure that we have preventive measures in place and contraceptives in place as well and educating people along the way. Thank you. 30 second rebuttal. Commissioner Shaw. Uh, no, <laughs> I made, made it clear. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Commissioner okay. Joseph. I'm good. Thank you. Mr. Jotty? Oh, good. 30 seconds. <laughs> so, so when you have an establishment in this community that gets all their campaign finance donations from the hospitals, from CareSource, they're not going to do anything to change any of this. They're going to sit there and say, oh, yes, we're going to keep doing what we've been doing, and we're going to give you deals on your real estate, and we're going to give you all kinds of... That's got to stop. The money in politics is killing us. And when you get huge donations from Premier and Kettering and CareSource, you can't be representing the people who are getting charged 
$3,000 for three stitches in the emergency room. That's, it's got to stop. Thank you. Ms. Ms. Turner Sauce. Yes, thank you. So, as constituents, right, it is very important that we inform, that we are informed. And so I challenge each and every one of you to make sure that you are doing just that. And if you look back a couple of weeks ago, this very same issue was an issue on the ballot. And one of our incumbents actually voted against this very same initiative to transferring the, the rights of women to have the, uh, the option to choose. So again, we have to make sure that we are being mindful about who we put in office and also keeping them abreast on the decisions and um, accountable rather on the decisions that they're making about us. We've gotten away from, and we have to get away from rather, allowing people to tell us one thing when it's elections time and then they're doing something completely opposite when it's time to make decisions about our lives. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Let's go on to our questions. Matt Joseph, we'll start with you. You'll have one and a half minutes for, uh, for your answer. Mind the timers here, please. Let's talk about the FBI investigation. Earlier this year, a Dayton City employee, a former city commissioner, a former state representative, were all arrested and faced federal charges. FBI assistant special agent in charge Joseph Dieters said, there is, and this is a quote, appears to be a culture of corruption in Dayton area politics. Governor Mike DeWine said he does not believe there is a culture of corruption in Dayton. He says there are just some bad people, that's a quote, some bad people in public office. The question here is, do you believe there is a culture of corruption in Dayton? And I'd like for you to explain why or why not. Matt, we'll start with you. You have 90 seconds. Sure. Thank you, Jim. No, I don't think there's a culture of corruption. I think that uh, in any organization the size of ours, you're going to have folks who are trying to take advantage of the system, try to take advantage of the position. But uh, I've been around for 16 years, and uh, I was as shocked as, as all of us were when, uh, when we found out about Joey. Uh, I was dismayed. I'd worked with him. I've worked closely with him for so long. Uh, but I, I, can, I can say that uh, we've worked on an investigation. The city manager is working on it now. We put in place a whistleblower line, so if there is anything and anybody's seeing it, they can call and report it right away, and we can take care of it. Uh, we're re-looking at our processes to make sure it doesn't happen again, and we're going to be vigilant to try not to. I, I was appalled, um, but we are going to be as vigilant as we can to make sure it doesn't happen again. David Israti. So I've been around a lot longer than Matt, and of course I don't get elected because I talk about things like this. So back when I ran for the very first time for mayor, and Clay Dixon had raised $28,000, which at that time was an unheard of amount, I said maybe it's from somebody who wants to build a landfill on the west side. And you know what? He took me outside, and we got in a fight, and it made the front page of the paper, and then finally the paper wrote the story about how he was double-dipping, calling in sick from work to go on city business, and next thing you know, we had Mike Turner for mayor. Not that that was a great accomplishment. But I can tell you the deals have been done in the back room of the Democratic Party and the Republican Party and in the Board of Elections for a long time. I've said you can't build a city by tearing it down, yet we've intentionally done things that basically make a lot of money for demolition contractors, and they give money to these politicians. And for Matt and Chris to say they didn't know Anything either means they were dumb, stupid, or they were never in the mix because they just do what they were told to do every time. There are very few times these two ever vote no to anything. They're having meetings in private still. They're discussing things that should be in public. They cut people off at three minutes. They don't respect the people. They respect their donors. This really has to change. It has to change. And I think the FBI and the DOJ were wrong to only indict for African-American males to say that they're the only ones doing it says we still have a problem in this country. Thank you. Shanice. Yeah. Thank you. A very important question. So I believe there is a pay-to-play politics philosophy in the city of Dayton. I really do. And I'm going to tell you a number of reasons why. First, I am a former City of Dayton employee, worked for the City of Dayton for seven and a half, eight years, and I'll tell you this from the process, and there may be some City of Dayton employees in the audience and maybe viewing as well. There is nothing 
Nothing that can go past that will happen in the city of Dayton by first it going through the various departments, by it hitting the city manager's desk, and then lastly, without three votes. So you cannot tell me or convince me that none of the other commissioners knew what was going on. It's impossible. The other thing is there are too many people in the city of Dayton that are suffering. All of the development that we have down, going on downtown, billion dollars have been spent in the city of Dayton's core, right? But then we're also selling development projects to huge developers for $10. But then you have landowners, um, excuse me, residents and homeowners who are taking care of vacant lots and properties next door to them, and they can't even get the property for a dollar. We're charging our residents $500 and up. There is a pay-to-play politics in the city of Dayton, and we have to change that. And it takes new leadership to do that. Thank you. Chris Shaw. I, 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 I do not believe that there's a culture of corruption in Dayton. Um, I was disappointed, just like everyone else, to hear. Uh, but uh, we've taken steps to address that. We've taken a look at all of our city policies, and I'm glad that the city manager uh, wanted to do that. We made it clear that we wanted to be very transparent, that we want to build back the confidence uh, that the citizens have in us. And it's important that we be as transparent as possible in that process. So uh, all of my colleagues, uh, made statements regarding our willingness to be transparent and would hope that the entire organization do so. We hired attorneys to scrub all of the, the policies and procedures that we do in that space, and I think it's making a difference. Uh, Commissioner Joseph talked about the hotline. We support that, and we support anyone who would want, be willing to come forward and give information. It's important. Uh, but no, I don't think that there's a culture of corruption in Dayton. Um, one of my opponents just talked about a billion dollars in spend in downtown. Well, sure, but that is not the city of Dayton spending a billion dollars. That's us leveraging limited resources and leveraging that investment so that private investors come in and do the same thing. If we sell a building for $10, that's probably a brownfield where if, unless you incent <laughs> the development, it's not going to happen. So. We, we do that. We do that kind of work, and it leverages multiple times the investment that we put into it that comes back. And I'm, I'm glad we ought to continue to do that work. Luckily now, it's not as important to do so. We've got the market that's driving it. On rebuttal, Matt Joseph. Yeah, I'll just actually continue where Commissioner Shaw left off there. Uh, he was just about to mention that we had a great announcement last week that Mendelssohn's uh, sold, Sandy Mendelssohn sold his building to developers. Uh, for a nice sum of money, we're going to have new apartments and who knows what kind of commercial development. And they didn't come to us for any money at all. It was a happy day. Uh, the, the market has picked up. We had to prime the pump for a long time during the bad times. We had to incent people to come in. We don't have to do that anymore. And it's really nice. They're coming in and spending a lot of money, going to bring new people, new businesses in. I also want to mention that uh, the model that we operate under is successful businesses downtown, successful folks downtown fund improvements in neighborhoods. And that's the model. If you hear people complaining about that, you need to ask them, where are you going to get the money to help the neighborhoods? If not, Dave is at Roddy, is Roddy on, on rebuttal. Really, because in South Park, we've managed to do all this without having given people money or given away businesses to compete with our own businesses that are here. The wheelhouse with the troll pub is not a brownfield site, and that's competing directly with people like Blind Bob's. That's competing directly with Lily's, with the corner kitchen, and they got the building for $10. You paid $450,000 for that building. That is not leveraging. That is leveraging donations to their campaigns. Look at issue nine, where we were vote, asked to vote to raise our income tax. The average donation to that campaign was $1,900. How many of you have given $1,900 to a, a politician? Thank you very much, One, Shanice. Yeah, On great. I, let me, let's talk afterwards. <laughs> Shanice. No way. 30 seconds. So that's exactly what I'm speaking of when I talk about transparency and being proactive. It shouldn't take for incidents such as the culture of corruption to take place in the city of Dayton for us now to put whistleblower uh, um, mechanisms in place or having a hotline. These are the things that should already take place before, again, incidents transpire. The other thing is, too, that you talk about leveraging dollars. 
I'm going to tell you exactly where that leverage in dollars has, has gone. It's gone to the fact that we're not pouring it into our neighborhoods. We are literally using our CDBG dollars, the dollars that we receive from our federal government that is targeted to our neighborhoods for low-income moderate fam families for affordable housing and to improve the quality of life. We're using those dollars to leverage the downtown development. Thank you very much, Chris Shaw. On rebuttal, 30 seconds. Thank you. Uh, we're very transparent. Our finances are online. Uh, they're open to anyone to see, and, and we're very proud of that. Uh, yeah, le leverage dollars, that's what we do, and it's, it's important to do so. The, the small geography in downtown Dayton drives economic development throughout the entire city, and we're on target for issue nine. All the issue nine uh, targets <laughs> are being met, and we're very happy with that. Thank you. So moving on with this economic development idea, starting with David Israti, for decades, tax abatements have been used as a key tool for the city to incentivize new commercial development. Dayton Daily News reported in 2015 that 41% or $2.6 billion of all the assessed property value in the city of Dayton is tax exempt. And almost 80%, more than half a billion dollars of the assessed value in the central business, business district is exempt from taxes. Revenue from property taxes goes directly towards funding Dayton Public Schools, which received an F rating from the state last year. Do you support the city's current tax abatement strategy? I could make this real short, but that wouldn't be as much fun, and I'll say no. <laughs> but the reality is this whole tax structure that we have with the constant reevaluation every three years and playing games with you know, what your neighbor does affects your property. Yet it doesn't affect the properties of all of these big businesses downtown. They got the abatements for 20 years and then they leave, like Kroger did on Gettysburg. There are serious problems. You shouldn't have to give a tax abatement to a business to come here where it is so affordable. Where else can you buy a 30-story Class A office building for seven million, nine million? That's that's unheard of. Mendelssohn's is half a million square feet. It sold for $7 million. In New York, there are people that pay that for an apartment, folks. The value has been sucked out of West Dayton. It's been sucked out of the neighborhoods. You're still paying taxes, but the man isn't because the man's buying the politicians for you and making sure that he gets the tax breaks. There, we have to come up with a plan and tell the state, you can't do this reevaluation thing. That We already know the property tax is unconstitutional funding formula for schools. We need to fix it. It's been 21 years, nothing's happened. I can't fix stupid at Dayton Public Schools, but I can fix the funding, okay? And we can fix the community so that the community gets the services and the values that they pay their taxes for. Thank you. Ms. Turner Sloss. Yes. This is a very important question for a number of reasons. So I absolutely do not support uh, the city's tactics and their means of tax abatement. I'm going to tell you uh, uh, one reason why in particular, because all it does, it repeats the history of what we've seen for decades of episodes of redlining. All it is is another mechanism to, again, to target and to keep um, our disadvantaged communities at a, at a, dis a d dis level. Excuse me. The other part of that, too, is um, when you talk about tax abatements, we are, in fact, essentially robbing from our school district. As a mother, I have two children that attend DPS. But there's other things that we could be doing to make sure that we are bringing economic development into the city of Dayton. And I presented this um, mechanism to the city of Dayton quite a few times, and that is a community benefits agreement. What that does, it allows, if you want to do business in the city of Dayton as a developer, you have to abide by X, Y, and Z. But again, it takes a, the leadership, it takes enforcement, it takes not just flowery language in an agreement or a contract, it takes the city manager and the commissioners to make sure that they're using their power to enforce this language in those agreements to make sure that, again, all areas in the city of Dayton are, in fact, benefiting from the economic Thank development that take place. Commissioner Thank Shaw. You. I have to agree. I, I I don't like giving tax abatements. Um, 
on, on the development projects that we do in downtown or really anywhere else. Sometimes it's necessary in order to spur development. And it's not just a giveaway, because oftentimes, or most of the time, these uh, abatements lead to jobs, and we need jobs in the city. To pay the income taxes that, again, fund the rest of all, everything that we do in this town. So it's important. There's, there's a time for uh, tax abatement. Um, but as Commissioner Joseph just mentioned, the tide is starting to turn, where the market is starting to drive development. And we don't have to do those tax abatements anymore. Community benefit agreements. Well, I'm glad that you brought that up because that's something that we're already doing. On projects where we give those abatements, we're talking to them about and entering into uh, a community benefit agreements with them, uh, giving back to the schools, providing low uh, rent uh, uh, opportunities for teachers. Many different kinds of ways. We're doing that kind of work. I'm glad you brought it up. It's important to continue doing that because community benefits agreements are very important. Thank you, Commissioner Joseph. Sure, yeah, we, we don't like to give away money. Uh, we don't like to give away tax abatements. Uh, because of the way the system's set up, uh, sometimes we need to do it to try to attract somebody, to try to bring jobs in. But I can tell you, though these last uh, 10, 11 years, uh, we put in clawback agreements. When companies come in and say, we want a tax abatement, uh, we, number one, we say, okay, if you, how many jobs are you gonna bring? What kind of revenue is it gonna bring to the city? Uh, what kind of benefits are you gonna bring to the neighbors? Uh, if they don't hit those marks, we take the money back. Uh, the second thing we do is we go to the school board to get approval before we build one of those tax abatements in. So in a lot of cases, what we do is we end up sharing with them 50-50 the money that we do get in. Um, and when a lot of cases, when it's a, a building that's not been used or it's a vacant piece of land, it's new revenue. So uh, it's, the schools weren't getting anything from it. Um, and if we split the money half and half with them, they're doing better than they would anyway. Uh, I just have to say that the question was a little bit skewed. The, the percentages, the high percentages of uh, tax exempt businesses downtown and in the greater Dayton area is mostly because a lot of our people work for nonprofits. Like uh, one of the, my opponents said, uh, whether it's university or a hospital, a ton of people downtown in the Dayton area work for those nonprofits. So that's a federal and a state rule that we have no control over. If you want to change that, we need to change at the state and federal level which we do, but, uh, but that, that's a whole different argument. Uh, so what we need to do with our money is be as stingy as possible and make sure that people live up to the agreements that they signed. Thank you. Mr. Dwality. I got a policy that I want to put in place. It's called Equal Opportunity Economic Development. That means that we are very clear about what you have to do in order to get a set tax break that is open to everybody, not doing a separate deal with each individual company that comes out and says, oh, we need a tax break. It has to be equal. It has to be to everybody. It has to be available to everybody and not being done this specific property, that specific property, this company or that company. Thank you. Ms. Turner Sloss, 30 seconds for rebuttal. So you heard the incumbents mention clawbacks and community benefit agreements and how they were glad that we brought it up, that I brought it up. So let me tell you this as well. Again, I mentioned that I brought this up to the commission and I also, it was an idea that we proposed for our uh, nonprofit neighborhoods over politics on a number of occasions through meetings and as well as a number of correspondence. So my question is, why do, should we can continue to elect the incumbents? If they're taking our ideas, if they're taking Thank our innovative thinking, Thank you. why should we continue to vote them in? Commissioner Shell. Well, I, I, I think uh, you want an elected official to listen. So if, if there's a good idea, you, you listen and you act on it. Just so but happens- you ain't coming up with none, so excuse me. me. Thank it you. Just so happens that- Commissioner Just so happens that we already had all of the things that most of the things that you're talking about in place. So, I mean, I, 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 I guess I believe you that you came up with an idea, an idea that was already happening. So thank you. But we listen. It's important to listen and we'll continue to thank do that. Thank you. <laughs> Commissioner Joseph, 30 second rebuttal. Sure. Uh, I just want to say again that we, we do it uh, with great reluctance. We take care of people's money. Uh, it, it's been a, a long, dry decade. We're finally starting to come out of it, starting to come out of the recession. We're still being very stingy with your money, with your tax money. Um, if we see an opportunity to get a ton of jobs for just a little bit of money, 
Uh, if we put in a little bit of money and somebody's going to put in a lot and develop a property, we're going to keep doing it. So building off this theme, um, how we're going to start with uh, Ms. Turner's loss. How would you hold the city manager and developers accountable for inclusion goals? For example, the Dayton Arcade has inclusion goals and the city has a large financial investment in this project. What happens if the inclusion goals aren't met? A very important question. We are experiencing that right now with the um, the development of the arcade, right? There are a number of opportunities for minorities and small businesses to be a part of this project, but yet and still, we are not enforcing those goals. And so as your next city commissioner, what I would do is make sure, again, as mentioned, we have clawback language in those agreements. But not only that, we have to utilize the services and the departments that we have in place. And that is our, our human relations council. The Department of our Human Relations Council is there for a reason. We have to utilize the staff, providing them with the tools and the resources that they need so that, again, we can make sure that we're meeting these goals to provide opportunity for small businesses and for minorities, because there is a lot of different projects that is going on in the city of Dayton, but a lot of people are being left out of those conversations. They're not in the room. They're not at the table. And as your next city of Dayton commissioner, I will make sure that I am enforcing those goals to be met. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Shaw. Yeah, it is important uh, that we have goals on these projects. Um, prior to ever thinking about running for office, I was part of the task force that put together the procurement enhancement plan. I'm very proud of the work that we've done. Is it perfect? No, it is not. But if you listen to the commission meetings, you'll find that uh, me and my colleagues, we uh, hold the city manager accountable and track the numbers and make it clear that we want to make sure that when there's a goal on a project, that we're, uh, we're reaching that goal. Uh, we've been very successful lately. I think that uh, there's a good opportunity here with the arcade project. We have a developer that from the very beginning, we talked to them about inclusion and how we can make sure that the spend in downtown goes out into the community. I'm, uh, I'm, there's always room for improvement, always. But uh, I'm, I'm happy with the, with the processes that are in place. We, uh, we are working with a developer that has had experience uh, in doing this kind of work and, and making sure that there's inclusion on pro uh, projects. And we were intentional about finding a developer that cared about that. Thank you. Just to clarify, what happens with the, when the inclusion goals are not met, Commissioner Joseph? Sure. Uh, the, the simple answer is first, uh, we claw back the money if they don't live to the agreements that uh, we've signed with them. Uh, the second is they can be banned from doing a business with the city. And that gets around too, because in these days when you can Google a company's name, if they've been banned with our city, uh, it, it makes them less likely to get business with others. But the, the root of the problem is here that uh, there are, it, it's difficult sometimes uh, when the state government and the federal government are pushing us to contract with out of state people with their policies, uh, to, to bring in crews from Texas or Alabama or whatever uh, right to work state, uh, whatever what to work state, right to work state is, uh, is, is, has the cheapest labor, and they bring it out here. They, it, it makes it tough for us to do it, but not impossible. The PET program that Chris talked about, the program that uh, gives advantages to minority businesses, small businesses, local businesses, uh, female owned businesses, uh, is one of the best in the country. I'll say it again, I'm gonna brag, it's one of the best in the country. It's a hard thing to do. You have to stick with it. You have to make sure the data is all there. We get reports on it quarterly. Uh, we get reports every time there's a contract, a certain percentage of, of target that needs to go to local businesses, women-owned businesses, minority businesses, et cetera. Um, and we hold the city manager and the staff accountable for that. Almost every week, somebody comments on that. Commissioner Mims this last week brought it up. Um, the one thing that it makes it difficult, uh, another thing that makes it difficult is that uh, we don't have the capacity in the city that we used to. Uh, we don't. We don't have the number of businesses that we used to. Our HRC that uh, Ms. Turner just Turner Sloss brought up Thank you. Uh, does a good job of trying to develop those businesses, Thank find you. them, and give them the capacities that they need to compete. David is ready. I want to shock you. Standing in front of you is a minority business. My business is a certified service disabled veteran owned business and a hub zone business. These are plans and policies put in by the federal government to try to turn 
tides and, and change things. And guess what? They don't work. We've had the CRA for I don't know how long. Almost all of Dayton is a hub zone. It has not brought us great riches. These programs have not worked. We keep talking about them. We keep talking about fixing these things, but we have institutionalized racism that has torn this community apart. We've seen development go out to the Austin Landing, the Pentagon Parkway. Why is it that the white people who work in white collar jobs at the top at Austin Landing and, and a multi-story building don't pay an income tax, but those who work in retail do? These kind of travesties have to stop. So if you want to see somebody that's going to make sure that the money isn't a trickle down, but is from a bottom up, I suggest you talk to me about my RTA plan. I want to say, let's make RTA free. It's not, the amount of money that they get from fares is less than 10%. It wouldn't cost us that much to get people to grocery stores, to their medical appointments, to their jobs, eliminate parking problems and develop buildings downtown. It's funny, the only free bus we have runs through the white part of town. Thank you. I'm going to fix that. Mr. Turner's last. 30 second rebuttal. So you heard that they're mentioning that we are currently um, actually doing some, could you repeat the question for me please? Sorry, thank you. Yeah. Uh, how would you hold the city manager and developers accountable for inclusion goals? For example, the Dayton Arcade has inclusion goals and the city has a large financial investment in this project. What happens if the inclusion goals are not met? Thank you. Thank you very much. So again, I mentioned to you that I am a former city of Dayton employee. And so one of the things and one of the, um, the advantages is that I have as a candidate for Dayton City Commission is I have the ability to dissect Thank you. The decisions that are being made or the potential programs and policies that will be presented to the commission because of my experience, because of my background. Thank you. I will not hold to what the city manager suggests Thank or you. recommend. Commissioner Shaw, 30 second rebuttal. Well, uh, Commissioner Joseph did say the PEP program is, is a model. It's uh, known as a model throughout this country for the kind of work that we do. I'm a small business owner, a minority business owner. Uh, I know how important it is to make sure that uh, opportunities uh, spread out throughout the community. Uh, small business is what drives our recovery, and it will continue to do so. And I'm going to do whatever I can do to support uh, small business. Uh, my opponent talked about RTA, free RTA. I, I don't know how a city commissioner affects that. <laughs> I used to work at RTA, and, and that's Thank not you. how it works. Commissioner Joseph. I uh, just want to reiterate that uh, we do the best we can. Uh, it is an uh, imperfect process. It's something we've got to keep working at. It's uh, supporting local businesses, supporting minority businesses. Uh, if you take your eye off the ball for a minute, if you lose track of the data, if you just let it run on, on cruise, it'll get out of hand and it'll go south quickly. So that's why we, take, we, we ask for quarterly uh, briefings in public at the commission meetings that everybody hears. They can hear how we're doing. If we fail, everybody hears it. Uh, if we're successful, they hear it too. So Thank you. Uh, we want to make sure that continues. Thank you. 30 second rebuttal, Mr. Israeli. Chris Shaw doesn't know how we fund RTA and fix that because he doesn't have a creative bone in his body and doesn't have an idea on how to make this happen. But he does know how to have city manager go out and spend $5 million in Twin Towers trying to build a Kroger store without a contract. The city manager has not been held accountable for that or for the hole in the ground that they caused on Ludlow, where they tore down the Schwind in the Dayton Daily News building and the, the, the demolition guy ends up holding the best piece of property. Where's the accountability? Thank Come you. on, people. And this will be the final question. We're going to do 30 seconds per candidate before we move on to closing statements. So just 30 seconds for this one. Two weeks after the mass shooting, two weeks after the mass shooting in the Oregon district, Devin Henderson and Javier Harrison were fatally shot in the back after allegedly trespassing in a detached garage in West Dayton. Both of them were 17 years old. The shooter who has claimed self-defense has not been arrested, taken into custody, nor have any formal charges been made over a month after Henderson and Harrison were killed. The mayor has stated she believes the two teens were murdered. Do you agree? And if so, what should happen? We're going to start with Commissioner Shaw, 30 seconds. Uh, yeah, that was uh, terrible, terrible. And I agree with the mayor. Um, uh, yeah, not being privy to all of the information, I think the investigation should go forward. But uh, apparently that is a question for the prosecutor 
And I think that, um, that he needs to be held accountable for that. So um, it, it's just uh, awful. Who really needs to be held accountable for that is the state legislature that puts forward these ridiculous stand your ground type laws that uh, this person is hiding behind. Thank you. And we have to make sure that we push back against that. And that's Commissioner what I Joseph. To do. I'm glad Commissioner Shaw brought up the, the ridiculous stand your ground laws that are sweeping the nation. They're irresponsible and wrong, and they enable situations like this. It's, uh, it's unconscionable. And I'll tell you, I'll say it again. We need to change at the state level. We need to change at the federal level. For things exactly like this. Do you believe the two were murdered? Do you agree yes. with the mayor? Yeah, oh, yeah. Thank you. Shot in the back. Mr. Zrati, 30 seconds. You can't shoot somebody for a property crime. You can shoot them when there's a risk to you, your body, etc. That didn't happen. He didn't say anything like that. And we, the problem is we have a culture of corruption in this community that has a prosecutor that's a part of it. We need a new prosecutor, folks. He hasn't even been opposed. You got to get people that aren't corrupt into public office. It's time to stop allowing these people to get away with basically murder. Yeah, he was murdered. The two Thank boys you. were murdered, and the, the person who did it Thank didn't you. go to jail. Ms. Turner's lost 30 seconds. So this issue is very dear to me for a number of reasons, because the two men, they did, in fact, lose their lives. But as a mother of two black boys, I am deeply concerned. And because of that, I am willing to make sure that I am fighting and working across the aisle that we address these issues. And I do believe the two young men, they were, in fact, murdered. Thank you. Very good. I want to thank all of our, not just the candidates, but all of the people here who are part of the audience, those people who are watching online tonight. Before we go to our um, closing statements, I want to have a round of applause for our timekeepers down front. <laughs> They've done an excellent job. <laughs> The candidates now will have one minute to sum up their statements. We're going to start in the uh, opposite order that we began. We'll begin with Matt Joseph. Each of the candidates will have one minute. Thank you, Jim. Uh, so I want to ask for your vote in November. Uh, it's been a tough, tough few years. We're starting to see the light. The sun's peeking through the clouds. We've done the best we could with what we've had to work with. We made sure that every four-year-old in the city has access to, to quality preschool at a reasonable price or free, depending on what you can afford. Uh, we've brought back uh, curbside leaf pickup. Uh, we cleaned up Lakeside Lake. Uh, we put measures in place to make sure that we have responsible contractors, uh, to make sure that uh, uh, the workers who work for the city, to make sure the workers that are our contractors get paid a decent wage. We're chipping away at these things that are bigger problems than we have. There are bigger problems than state, there are state level and federal level problems, but we're doing the best we can at our level to take care of those. I promise you I'm going to keep focusing on getting jobs and better jobs for our citizens. I'm going to make sure that citizens get the services they need in their neighborhoods, and I'm going to chip away at this inequality that really needs chipping away at it. It's not an easy task. It's not a task of a year or two, but I'm going to keep aiming at a 20- and 25-year plan to, to make things better for all of our neighborhoods. Thank you. Chris Shaw. Chris? Okay. Yes, I, too, uh, want to ask you for your support, for your vote in November or tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, I am proud of the work that I've done these past four years, linking children, linking others with apprenticeship, good-paying apprenticeship opportunities, strengthening the pipeline from school to work. It's, it's critically important. It's how we attract businesses to our community. The first question that I get when we're talking to developers or to site selectors is, what's the schools look like? But more importantly, what does your workforce look like? Are they highly trained? Are they skilled? Will they come to work? These are the things that I'm working on because I know that the way out of many, most of the problems that we have in our community is related to lack of jobs, high paying, high quality jobs that support families and support neighborhoods. We want to roll out the work, the development that's been happening in downtown. We're intentional about doing that. It's starting to happen already. I am very pleased with the work that we've been doing and the progress, but it can always be better. And we're going to continue to work toward that end. And when you elect me, you'll see that things will get better. So again, I want to thank you all for being here this evening. Thank you for posing your very important question. So this is not a ploy for me, simply put. I am very passionate about the city of Dayton. I am passionate about the residents in the city of Dayton. And we have to do better than what we're currently doing. 
We have treated this position as a symbolic role. We have treated it as a, a springboard for our political aspirations. I'm asking each and every one of you to be intentional this election cycle and to treat it as a job. Because of my experience, I know the inner workings of government, and I'm willing to continue to fight for the city of Dayton as a resident and as an advocate, in which I've been doing for a very long time, and I'll continue to, continue to do so. Again, this is not a ploy for me, and I want you all to know that we have to do better. The residents in the city of Dayton deserve better. We deserve clear processes, we deserve accountability and transparency, and we deserve accessibility. I ask for your votes tomorrow or on November the 5th. Thank you for your time. David Israti. So you have a choice. You can reelect the same people and get the same results you've had, or you can vote for Shanice and myself and change things. That's basically how it works out. So if you just elect one of us, it doesn't really change things because there's still three votes from the culture of corruption. They say, how, how do you pay for RTA? Well, I'm in advertising. It's create a business. One of the interesting things was, you used to be able to buy ads on the outside of buses. They don't do that anymore. They blame the union. We can't put the, 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 the ads on the buses fast enough or cheap enough. Come on, we can fix that. We can generate enough revenue from ads on the buses, especially when they're full and they're being ridden by people of all classes, to be able to pay the difference of the $10 million or $9 million that the fares bring in. It's really, it's less than 10% of their, their revenue. And when you count, see what the difference is when you start with the bottom up, you see what happened in South Park. Please, think twice, vote for change. Let's have a round of applause for all our candidates tonight. If you want to find out more about all the candidates or anything that's on the ballot this go around, go to online vote.daytondailynews.com. Before we finish tonight, the final word. Thank you so much for being out here. Uh, being in this room means you care and you know, we need to all join together. We can't leave it up to just everybody on this stage to, to make a change. So thank you for being here. The Dayton Daily News has been live streaming this. You can share this with your friends who weren't here to make sure that they're informed. So share, uh, you don't have to wait till November 5th to vote. You can go to early voting and we'll see you at the polls. Thank you. <laughs>